Good morning. Good morning. It's another beautiful day in Alpena, Michigan. I uh, had somebody tell me that our apple trees are looking very nice, so thank you for the compliment. And uh, if you didn't notice, Laura's here. Uh, yeah. <laughs> And we have visitors from Washington State, too, I believe. So, and uh, the, from the Beck family, I, I, I should uh, point out. And uh, let's see, any other visitors who might wish to be recognized? I think I recognize the rest of you as members or regular attenders, so. Okay, um, let's see, August Tartan is out. And uh, I know it's in the racks, and you, it should be available online shortly. So, uh, yeah, get your copy, uh, hot off the presses. Uh, there will be a session meeting directly after the service in the uh, library. And uh, we're going to be uh, talking to Carrie Kane. So that's our, that's our mission for, uh, for right after the service. <clears throat> I, flowers, I believe, are from... Uh, the service yesterday for Craig uh, Mindikowski, and I uh, ask you to keep uh, in memory uh, or in prayer uh, the family who was remembering uh, his life and uh, his passing. Um, that's all I have. Uh, does is there are there any other announcements that need to be made? Just, I just want to thank everybody that had participated in setting up and cleaning up and bringing food and, you know, pastor doing the service and stuff because Craig was not a member. He was a firm believer in God, but um, this church just embraces everybody and we felt the love and the support and Kelly and Vi are exhausted today, so I'm just thanking everybody all the donations, and we just have a wonderful church family, and we're so blessed. Thank you. Amen. Any other announcements? Then let us worship God. Good morning. Good morning. Ruth, this is for you. <laughs> Our call to worship, blessed be God whose word gives hope 
and shapes our dreams. Blessed be God, whose love has honored death. Best, blessed be God, who ordered our way and guides our steps. Blessed be God, who leads us to life. Let us worship our God together. Based on selected verses from Psalms 119, your statues are wonderful, therefore I obey them. The unfolding of your word gives light, giving us understanding. I wait in expectation, longing for your commands. Turn to me and have mercy on me. And save your always do to those who love your name. Direct my footsteps according to your word. Let no sin rule over me. Redeem me from human oppression that I may obey your precepts. May your face shine on your servant and teach you your decrees. Tears flow from your eyes when your law is not obeyed. The first hymn of today is Jesus, Thy Boundless Love to Me, number 366. Please rise if you are able. to confession, God is for us who can be against us. Let us confess our sins to the one who searches us and knows us. Our prayer of confession, we confess that we have turned away from you and have not lived with upright hearts. We hear your words and do not heed it, but we do not love you with our whole heart, nor do we love our neighbor as ourselves. We do not seek to do what is right in all circumstances. Now let us take a few moments to contemplate our private sins against God and against each other. Now let us pray. Lord, guide our feet to walk in your ways and to serve your world to the glory of your name, amen. Our assurance of pardon, my friends, the Lord God forgives us our sins through the work of Jesus Christ our Lord. Be at peace for all things, work together 
for good of those who love God. Children, please come forward. How was Montana? Good, you had a good time. Oh, that's nice. Well, we're glad you're back, you're home. You're here with us. Still, so far away. Oh, I got something to show you. It's really beautiful. Oh, are you ready? You want to take a look? seen anything like that? Well, can't actually see anything, did you? Okay, but I'm going to give you some hints. Here we go. The thing that I want you to see is very important, and we all use it, and there's a lot of it, thankfully, and it's not very heavy. It's all around. That's right, air, okay, and we breathe it, it's very important, isn't it? And even though the air is important to us, but once I described it, then you knew exactly what I was talking about, didn't you? When I just showed you the empty basket, it's like, hmm, there's nothing there. Okay, in a similar way, there's a story from the Bible, Actually, it's called the Kingdom of Heaven. Uh, it's a parable story. And Jesus is trying to help the people see what the Kingdom of Heaven looks like. And to help people see, God tells them a story. And he describes the Kingdom of Heaven by telling these short stories called parables. And here's how Jesus describes the Kingdom of Heaven. The kingdom of heaven starts small, but can become really big. Like a mustard seed starts small and then grows into a big plant. And just a little bit of the kingdom of heaven is added to something else, then we have a big effect on that other thing. Just like a little bit of yeast and some bread and the, makes the dough rise up. The kingdom of heaven is also valuable that people who know its value will make it great efforts and give everything they have to get in. The kingdom of heaven is filled with an abundance of good things that cannot be ruined by bad things. So that's what the kingdom of heaven looks like, even though, like air, it can be hard to see with our eyes. We can't see heaven, can we? Sounds like a good thing, though, huh? 
Jesus thought so too. And Jesus said that a person who knows about the kingdom of heaven is like someone with a treasure who then shares that treasure with others. And just like air is something that is important, it's good, and shouldn't be kept from others, so too is the kingdom of heaven. Something that is important, good, and shared with others. With air, we already know how to use it, right? We know how to breathe in the air. And, but when it comes to the kingdom of heaven, we have to learn what it is, right? And how to choose it and how to share it with others. And we do this, can you think of ways how we learn about heaven? Think of some ways. Come, come to church, right? Yeah, and we read stories out of the Bible. Yeah. And we talk about those stories, just like we're doing here this morning. And even singing hymns, we learn about heaven. And the more we do these things, the more we will learn and then know about God's kingdom and how to live in, in here and now, and how to share it with others, right? And that's pretty good, yes. Let's pray. You can all help us, which is a repeat after me prayer. Dear God, thank you for Jesus, who teaches us about the kingdom of heaven, so we can share your kingdom with those around us. Thank you and amen. Thank you, girl. Please put yourselves in a posture for prayer. Blessed God, you are with us as we climb the peaks, and you are with us when we trek through the lowest valleys. Your presence guides us over the winding roads and through the dense forests. Your spirit is the wind in our sails as we traverse the seas, both calm and stormy. Lord, we thank you for being with us. We only ask that you open our hearts and minds and souls to your ever presence, that we might feel the lift of your eternal love in your mercy. Lord, we pray for all who are weary, all who are ill, all who suffer from anxiety, that they may be healed by the breath of your spirit in your mercy. Lord, we ask you to be with those who need financial help, that they might find the path to solvency and stability in your mercy. God of power, we ask that you be with those suffering from addictions, whether it be drugs, alcohol, electronic devices, or questionable media. Lord, give them the strength to manage and overcome their addiction and channel their energies toward bringing goodness into the world. In your mercy. Are there any personal concerns that you would like to lift up? Bill and Connie. We pray for Bill and Connie in your mercy. I have a prayer, a praise for the fact that my 17-year-old granddaughter, Madeline, who was in the hospital in Chicago this week is home and having a very good recovery. And so I thank people for the prayers for Madeline this week. And I ask for continued prayers for my brother-in-law, Roger. We lift up Madeline. We thank you, Lord, for uh, her recovery. Uh, praise be to God. And we also pray for Roger in your mercy. Lord, 
Continued prayers for my grandson, William. We pray for William in your mercy. I know Sam has a prayer he would like to read. This is by Annie Johnson Flint. I offer it in support of all who have lost someone recently. There are loved ones who are missing from the fireside and the feast. There are faces that have vanished. There are voices that have ceased. But we know they passed forever from our mortal grief and pain. And we thank thee, O oh, our Father, for the blessing that remains. In your mercy. Lord, Lord, hear our prayer. For my niece, Sheena. Pray for Sheena in your mercy. Lord, hear our prayer. For all those suffering extreme heat. For all those suffering from extreme heat, in your mercy. Anyone else have something they would like to lift up? For our granddaughter who was just born and needs to gain weight. For, for Evelyn Grace, in your mercy. Anyone else have something they would like to lift up? All right, then let us pray in the words our Savior taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debts. And we us not. Jesus said that the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, the smallest of all seeds. But when it has grown in its, it is the greatest shrub and becomes like a tree so that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. Let us offer our gifts this day for the kingdom of heaven is near. Join together for the prayer of dedication. We dedicate our lives to you today and seal that promise by way of this offering. We give out the abundance of our hearts that the treasure of your kingdom may be shared with many. Thank you for giving us grateful hearts and a spirit of generosity, the flourishing of your realm. Our sect. Oh, amen. And our second hymn is Jesus, Our Divine Companion, number 305.
our prayer of illumination. Enlightening God, the unfolding of your word gives light and provides wisdom to all who seek your truth. Open our minds and hearts by the presence of your Holy Spirit that the mystery of your heavenly realm is made evident here on earth. Our first scripture reading is Matthew 13, 31 through 33. The parable of the mustard seed. He put before them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed that someone took and sowed in his field. It is the smallest of the seeds, but when it has grown, it is the greatest of shrubs and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. In the parable of the yeast, he told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed in with three measures of flour until all of it was leavened. This is the word of the Lord. Our special music today is How Beautiful, written by Twyla Paris and Benjamin Harlan, performed by Maureen Sweet, and accompanied by Sue Lynn Barr.
Thank you, Murray. Our second scripture reading is from Paul's letter to the Romans, and it's chapter 8, verses 26 through 39. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God knew, foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who, who can be against us? He who did not share his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. No one. Christ Jesus who died more than that who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. The word of God. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Paul, the evangelist, Paul of Tarsus, is often referred to as the great evangelist. He is also understood by many scholars as one of the first great theological thinkers of the church. His writing can be both beautifully subtle, and carry tremendous force at the same time. When we read from the letters of Paul in the New Testament, we come to see how the words of the Bible truly are inspired through the Spirit. It seems like Paul has a way of expressing himself with piercing understanding and with complete sympathy at the same time. I come back to Paul and especially his letter to the Romans over and over again. My personal relationship with this letter actually began when I was about 10 years old. I can remember going to church one Sunday morning with my parents and my siblings. We crowded a pew in the chapel of the Air Force Base where my dad was stationed, Omaha, Nebraska at that time. We pretty much took up the whole pew with all of our coats and our paraphernalia of our, my baby sister. And my father anchored one end and my mother anchored the other and my littlest sister, you know, she sat right next to my mom. My next sister was placed between my brother and I in the hopes that she would be a buffer preventing horseplay between us. I'm sure she suffered in her role, because that was week after week after week. She is a woman of patience now, 
seemingly able to deal with uh, the travails of this life. I put it down to that experience. I don't think it was until I was about eight or nine that I really started paying any attention to what was going on in the service. Of course, I knew when to stand up, when to sit down, when to say some particular words, or when to sing, or at least to look like I was singing, and maybe I still do that once in a while. At some point, I started listening to the readings. I have to admit, I did not always find them interesting at that age. Discussion regarding good and evil, you know, and then relational stuff, and then theology. Who, who was interested at that at that age? Well, I was more interested in football and history. You know, the gladiators on the football field and the ones in the Roman Colosseums. You can imagine how my ears pricked up when I heard that the reading for that week was going to come from the book of Romans. I was imagining something involving cohorts marching with Caesar and Antony and Pompey and that whole gang conquering some Mediterranean country or even more likely fighting a civil war. You can imagine when I thought when the reading began. It didn't have anything to do with those guys. I hadn't known it was just this hugely long letter to some people in Rome. But now that my mind was engaged, I listened. I gave the words a chance to sink in. The imagery that Paul used began to grip me. I honestly don't remember which reading it was, but it might have been the very one that we have before us today, because I remember the almost martial language Paul wrote, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Lots of martial language in there, isn't there? This could be a speech to some general to his troops just before battle. Paul says, we are more than conquerors. You almost have to wonder, does this conquest have to do with military struggle, or is it a different kind of struggle? Paul, I think, was quite aware of the horrors of war, and this is why he speaks of war and the sword in this context. His goal in this passage is to tell us that God loves us so much that he will love us no matter how bad things get, even in the midst of struggle and strife. And God, he tells us, proved this to us by sending Jesus Christ to redeem us. We know God is the ultimate power, right? Greater than any army we might muster. And this is how Paul can say, if God is for us, who could be against us? So we conquer all, not in a material sense, but in a spiritual sense. This is how we are all conquerors. As Paul says, it is through him who loved us. And this conquest Paul speaks of is not destroying others, but is a conquest over ourselves and over the consequences and circumstances in which we live. The trials and tribulations that beset us throughout our lives, you know, they can be difficult. And what are these trials that Paul enumerates? For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither present nor future nor any powers, neither height nor depth nor anything else in all creation is going to be able to take away from us the great gift that God gives us, which is God's love and the consequences for that love. With God, then, we need not fear death or the trials and tribulations of this life. Even spiritual powers cannot harm us in the form of angels or demons or what have you. We need not fear the future or regret the past. 
When he talks about the height and depth, what is he talking about? I've heard it posited in some commentaries that he's talking about the very universe itself in its dimensions, height and depth. And so we need not fear anything at all. So this is how Paul defines victory, that nothing will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Jesus Christ, our Lord, because the love of God is what ultimately saves us. This victory is not accomplished through violence, but through love, the love of God. And the final verse of the chapter, we find that it is the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. When I read this line, I thought it was interesting that it read just slightly different than the earlier sentence Paul wrote, which asks, who shall separate us from the love of God? It's a rhetorical question which Paul proceeds to answer, and we have gone through Paul's argument, which is nobody, no thing, nothing in all creation can separate us from the love of God. The only thing that possibly could maybe separate us just might be ourselves. But that, leave that for another sermon. But now, in Paul's conclusion, we get a little preposition. And that preposition is in, as the love of God in Christ Jesus is what saves us. And I went to look at this passage in Greek thinking, ah, well, maybe, you know, the translation was a little... Uh, off in the NIV, but in Greek, in is en, en, which is epsilon nu in Greek, in case you are worried about that, and indeed, the Greek lexicon tells me that en means in, and that's a little, uh, probably more than you wanted to know, but for me, it was important information. That little preposition makes seems to me to make that concluding sentence just a little bit uh, enigmatic, you know, kind of mystery. Let me read that line to you again. Nothing can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. It is in Christ Jesus, but we can't be separated from it. So how does this work? You know, I was trying to figure that out. So does this mean that we receive the love of God through Jesus? Is it like it goes into Christ first and then pours over us? Or is this a vague Trinitarian statement telling us that the love of Christ is the same as the love of God? Perhaps the love, the spirit is the love of God. Now I was half inclined to this view, but uh, some of you know I took a, I, I read through a book on, by Karl Barth and uh, one of the places I delved into was the book of Romans. And Karl Barth has a pretty neat answer for us. And he tells us that Jesus was and is fully human and fully divine. And we knew that already, right? We, we talk about that quite a bit, uh, Christ being fully human and fully divine. And in that fullness, Christ contains the love of God for humanity, and at the same time, being fully human contains all the love of humanity for God. Christ then is love, the focus of all love, fully human and fully divine. And this is a hugely important concept. This has ramifications for our daily lives, knowing that the focus of our lives must be on Jesus and that the focus of God is also on Jesus, properly directing our lives. We know that we can rise above the difficulties that assail us. This is our direct connection with God through Jesus Christ. Well, it's a basic truism of history that uh, all of the, for the most part, a record of the folly of humanity, war after war, heaval, upheaval upon upheaval is what history is mainly all about, right? And we are justifiably interested in such things, just as I was interested in it as a boy, sitting there in church, thinking about the Romans. For knowledge, in many cases, helps us to avoid 
the mistakes of the past. Though truthfully, we often bury that past so deep in history books that uh, we have trouble finding it again. <laughs> and some, often we are doomed to repeat history uh, and the lessons that were learned by previous generations. What Paul is telling us is that when Christ entered history, he also transcended history, went above history, went beyond history. Before Christ, humanity was separated from God, but through Christ, we are now connected to the love of God in Christ, through Christ's humanity, and through Christ's divinity. As we travel through the ups and downs of our personal histories, and the whole history of humanity, we maintain that connection to God in Christ. No matter what happens, we know that we are loved and God will help us through. So we have won the battle already before it even begins, whatever that battle may be, through that connection with Christ. The bottom line is this. The love of God in Christ will always see us through. Amen. Please pray with me. Blessed God, Paul tells us the plain fact that you love us. There is nothing that can come between us and your love for us. If there is a flaw in our relationship, the flaw must be within us. When we reject you, when we harm one another, we are working to place barriers in your path. Though we, attempt to alien, though we might attempt to alienate you in spite of our best or worst efforts, when we return to you again, we find that you still love us. Amen. Our final hymn is number 376, Love Divine. All loves excelling, please rise as you are able.
the benediction. Please remain seated, listen to the postlude, and think about what you've seen and heard today. And then after the postlude, please rise, greet each other with a sign of peace, and uh, please all meet in Fellowship Hall so that uh, we may commune together. We come here to worship God in the sanctuary, and we go to the sanctuary to be with the body of Christ together. So uh, we always look forward to that, but there's also going to be a session meeting, just a final reminder, and Carrie's gonna, going to be there, and uh, that will be in the library, so if you're on session, uh, uh, please go there first. I don't think it'll be a very long meeting, so. All right. <clears throat> Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.